Good morning. Um, we're just about to start. And um, just let me uh, mention that in case that we need to evacuate the building again, <laughs> uh, please notice the exit signs around you. And um, uh, the restrooms are on the uh, I Street side of the main lobby, in case you need to do that um, before we evacuate the building again. Um, for the uh, folks in the internet, uh, we really strongly urge you for the Q&A to send your questions to the address that you see below the monitor. Um, we really would appreciate you sending them as soon as you can so we can have time to take them on the air. So with that, uh, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's seminar entitled Kitchen Ventilation Solutions to Indoor Air Pollution Hazards for Cooking. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to provide some context for today's seminar. So cooking and gas stove can emit hundreds of chemicals, and many of which are toxic, including like gases, pollutants, ultrafine, fine particles, metals and others. In addition, cooking can also produce moisture and odors. And previous study found um, such air pollutant emissions from cooking and gas stoves can exceed health benchmarks. And health effects include like increased asthma symptoms uh, and upper respiratory disease in children. There are several ways to remove air contaminants, moisture, and odor from kitchens, such as like, wrench hood, open windows, wall or ceiling, uh, exhausted fans. However, it's unclear how effective these uh, solutions are and if the currently available solutions are not effective enough, how should we improve their performance? And are there any test methods needed to quantify their effectiveness? So I think today's seminar will provide you some uh, answers to these questions. So with these questions in mind, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Brack Singer. And Dr. Singer is a, sci a staff scientist and principal investigator in the Environmental Energy Technologies Division of Lawrence Berkeley National La Laboratory. And uh, his talk will cover the hazards associated with gas stoves and cooking emissions, laboratory and in-home measurements of wrench hood performance, the characteristic of effective wrench hoods, and some of the challenges in achieving high performance and the potential effectiveness of general kitchen ventilations. And please join me to welcome Dr. Singer. Is the mic working? Good, OK. Hopefully, if anybody in the webinar can't hear me, now's the time to send that comment in, because people in the room should be fine. Uh, great. So I, there's a lot of material. I have two hours, right? No, that's just a joke. It's, uh, it's, it's probably about uh, uh, 50 minutes to an hour's worth of material. There's a couple of things I'm going to mention during the, the talk that, that I'm going to invite you to ask, question, ask me questions later if you want to hear more about it. And uh, about a number of things, I'll go into more detail. So uh, I'm trying. there's a lot of information here. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a scientist, so this is a great opportunity to share what I've learned. Uh, and hopefully, you'll find it interesting. And uh, uh, mostly questions at the end. If somebody in the room has a clarification question along the way, feel free to raise a wing, and I'll try to answer it along the way. Um, so, so none of this happens without uh, support for the research. And I've been very, very lucky. Uh, one of my program managers at uh, California Energy Commission, Marla Mueller, is sitting right here. Uh, a lot of the work you've seen here is, was strung together through bits and pieces of different research projects where Marla saw the, the, the importance of doing this work uh, along the way before it became sort of a, a hotter button issue, which is becoming now. And that has enabled us to put together some of these research results. Also, um, the DOE Building America program and support from HUD and EPA, uh, federal EPA. Uh, of course, this doesn't happen by me 
doing all the work by myself. So there's a, a very large research team that's contributed to various aspects of this. I want to point out in particular Woody Delp. You're going to see him in a picture later. A lot of the range of performance stuff is, is really thanks to uh, you know, his ingenuity and his prowess as a research engineer. So uh, there's a real simple side to this story, which is that, as Zoe mentioned, uh, both the cooking burners and the cooking itself produce pollutants that can impact indoor air quality, also produces moisture, occasionally produces things like smoke, real bad problems, odors, et cetera. And, and in, 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 in a very simple way, exhaust ventilation is a very robust answer to that. Um, but it's not always a, 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 an effective solution. So what we really want, ideally, is to make sure that the exhaust ventilation is effective, it's low energy, quiet, and satisfies all of our needs. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So when I say, what do we want from kitchen ventilation? I always like to start from the perspective of we being people. And then I'll talk in a minute about what we as indoor air quality building science professionals want. I, I think most people uh, want something that can remove the smoke and odors as needed. And that, we have survey data that sort of reinforce that. This is how they are used. So people expect to be able to push a button when things go awry in their cooking, OK? And, and have, have it get fixed, OK? Um, for some people, it's an aesthetic element. Uh, certainly can remove odors and moisture. And, and I think most people you know, don't want to pay more than they have to. It's a common thing. But as, as professionals in this field, we recognize that there are pollutants that are formed in those cooking, the burners, et cetera. So that, that serves a very important indoor air quality function. We wanted to have that functionality. Um, we also, we collectively, Energy Commission, we want to have this be low energy. We don't want to use a lot of energy to provide this functionality. And eventually, uh, we'd like to have this, we, the research team, would like to have this to be automatic because we have evidence that as long as it's required to push that button, people aren't going to always know when there's a lot of nitrogen dioxide in their home. And, and, and that should come on automatically. When you use your water heater, you don't have to push a button for the water heater exhaust to vent outdoors. And we think the same should be true for stoves. Of course, we don't want fire. Uh, we don't want excessive noise. We don't want maintenance problems. We all have enough to do as it is. And, and bad aesthetics, of course, is in the eye of the beholder. But I, I particularly like this picture here. Um, of course, we also don't want higher energy bills. And uh, we also don't want to cause another indoor air quality problem. So we don't want to put in a range hood that's going to cause the water heater or the furnace to backdraft and spill pollutants into the home. So this is sort of the collection of requirements or needs. I'm going to skip this one because you're going to stick around and see the presentation. So that was more for my own purposes of putting it together. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we get pollutants both from the burners and the cooking. I just want to point out uh, gas burners is a flame. We think of natural gas as generally a clean uh, source of combustion, and it is, okay, in general. But uh, we, we, this is an open flame in your home, so when things are going well, it's still producing carbon dioxide and moisture. It can produce a lot of moisture. Uh, and then even when things are basically going well, many of these flames are producing substantial amounts of nitrogen dioxide and formaldehyde. And it doesn't take a lot to go wrong for them to start producing CO and ultrafine particles. People think, well, but how about electric burners? That's not a flame. Those are fine, right? Great research results demonstrating that electric burners very commonly produce ultrafine particles. And then the cooking itself produces ultrafine particles, VOCs. Acrolene is a very important indoor air, uh, air pollutant. Uh, and then again, the moisture and odors. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pretty good literature. This is by no means a comprehensive set. These are some of the papers I refer to. I provide this just as a resource. So uh, in the further slides, when you see a, a, a Logan et al. paper or whatever, this will make it easier for you to go find that, that material. OK, so the pollutant thing. This is a serious issue. This is not just a qualitative. We know they produce pollutants. Sometimes it can be a problem. We've done quantitative work. We've done an array of uh, studies to, to try to quantitate this. Um, these first results are from a modeling study. Uh, and, and I came up with the wrong order here. But this was a modeling study where we looked at homes in Southern California that cook with gas. We have actual information on home age, how much people cook, uh, uh, lots of other information that we pull in. To, we use a physical simulation model. We use measured emission rates that we measured in the laboratory from uh, about a dozen different uh, cooking burners, uh, cooking ranges. 
and we simulate air exchange. We simulate the whole process of the cooking, how frequently it happens, what's the air exchange rate. It's all physics. It's all based on physics. And from these simulations, we come up with some really surprising numbers in terms of how commonly we have indoor air quality problems from just the cooking burners now. This is gas burners. So among this population of Southern California homes, this was homes that have gas burners and use them at least once per week. So this includes people that are just using the burners once per week. Among those homes, we estimate roughly 55 to 70 percent in a typical winter will exceed federal indoor air, uh, federal uh, outdoor air quality standards for NO2. Okay, uh, that's this is just looking at one week. So typically, in a, in a typical winter week, we estimate that more than half of the homes are exceeding a federal outdoor air quality standard inside their home. Okay. If that was outdoors, we'd all have a big problem, okay? The, you know, the ZRB, when was the last time we had an NO2 exceedance outdoors? Not very frequent, right? NO2 is probably the single biggest uh, air quality problem from, from the uh, criteria pollutants in terms of the number of people who are exposed in the country. Because these, these are Southern California results, but we think these actually apply broadly across the US because the fundamentals are not so different. Air exchange rates, emission rates, cooking patterns, those things do vary, but broadly, if you're using these open flames in your home without venting them, you very commonly reach pollutant levels that are problematic. Um, I here I mentioned the ATSDR. More relevant to California is the OEHA standard. So the OEHA one hour standard is 55 microgram per meter cubed. So just from formaldehyde, uh, we, we estimated about half the homes exceed that one hour uh, OEHA formaldehyde. I'm sorry, about a quarter of the homes exceed the OEHA one hour formaldehyde, and about 50% of the homes exceed the nine microgram per meter cubed eight hour standard. And then even CO, right? We never have CO problems, except in homes with gas burners. And we estimate that it's somewhere on the order of seven, eight percent exceed uh, California and federal uh, short term CO standards. Okay, and this is just what I mentioned. There's a, a paper that will be coming out in environmental health perspectives. Uh, it's been provisionally accepted. We're still sort of working on some editorial stuff there. So that was the burners. Let's talk about the cooking. So this is some data from homes in Ontario, Canada. Yeah, I know it's Canada, but they're not that different. Uh, and what, what you're looking at is on the, on the left side of the picture is the indoor particle concentrations, and on the right side is outdoor. And what you see, and this is a ratio of each hour to the daily mean, so you can see the diurnal pattern. And what you see on the left side is there's a big bump in ultrafine particles in PM2.5 right around dinner time. Isn't that interesting? Okay, well, what is that? It's obviously the cooking. And then if you look at the next picture, this shows the indoor-outdoor ratio, and it reinforces that. Okay, so this is, yes, there are diurnal trends outside, but this is something that's being emitted indoors from cooking, and it's both ultrafine particles and PM2.5. Uh, here's some data from Hong Kong. Uh, people say, oh, again, it's Hong Kong. Well, you know, we have a lot of people in California do Asian cooking as well. Okay, and what you're looking at here, I thought this was an interesting one because this gets to the sort of spread around the home. This looks at uh, measurements in the kitchen and in the living room. And what you see is that the people who are in the kitchen, which is very often just when, you're, when there's cooking happening, there's usually somebody in the kitchen. Okay, well, that person's breathing that stuff in. And very often uh, young children will be there because if, if, if a parent is cooking, they're going to have their young children somewhere nearby. So whether it's the kitchen or the room just next to the kitchen, um, so the much higher concentrations in those areas, and, and there's lots of other data that reinforce that. So the red here is uh, the concentrations in the kitchen, and the black is the concentrations elsewhere. During the cooking event, concentrations go up. Afterwards, the air mixes around the homes, and it starts going down. But during those cooking events, you have a substantial increase in the kitchen. Uh, this is looking at, that was, ultra, that was the ultrafine particles, or particle number. This is particle mass, same story, higher in the kitchen substantially elevated concentrations with cooking. OK, am I beating your head over? I just like keep beating on this. So this is back to the cooking burners. Uh, I showed you before simulations. These are measurements now. And this gets to the fact that it really is the cooking burners. It's not other gas appliances. So this was a CEC supported project. We did monitoring in 350 homes in California. Six days, we sent monitors out. We measured a whole bunch of stuff. We have data from. Real-time data from CO, we have uh, one-week integrated NOx measurements, NO2 NOx. We've measured indoors and outdoors. 
uh, and we looked at different groups of homes. So what you're looking here is the highest one hour carbon monoxide measured during the six day period. And the four groups are no, no gas appliances at all, uh, only vented gas appliances, this is like water heaters and furnaces with venting. The third group is cooking appliances, cooking burners, but nothing else. And the fourth group is cooking plus the vented. And what this shows is that when you just have the vented appliances, mostly they work pretty well. So we don't see big increases in those homes. You start looking at cooking, boom, it jumps up. And then cooking plus the other appliances looks the same as just the cooking. The cooking burners are the problem, which makes sense because they're not vented. This is same data source for NO2. Uh, previously, I talked about the short-term stuff. To measure uh, short-term concentrations requires uh, a much more sophisticated analyzer, and we're going to be doing that as well, but this is time integrated. Same story. You see a big jump in NO2, and this is just the indoor NO2. We've accounted for the outdoor. Big jump in NO2 when you have cooking burners. Um, a, a quick quick note here, again, uh, I just want to make this point very clear. The question always comes up, so does that mean that I only have to worry about gas burners? I don't need to vent if I have electric burners. The answer is no, you definitely do need to vent if you have electric burners because the electric burners produce ultrafine particles and you're still cooking. So electric burners does not mean you don't need venting. Uh, the context here, Zoe did a nice job of talking about the things we can do for air quality management. Uh, source control, general ventilation. Obviously, we're mostly talking about task ventilation here. Uh, I'll say a word in the end about filtration and air cleaning. And then uh, different characteristics of ventilation. It could be general, local, passive, mechanical, manual, automatic, continuous, intermittent. Uh, obviously, here, it's, 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 this is a relatively important point. It's local, obviously, so that's good because you're trying to remove the source, remove, remove the pollutants at the source. Obviously, it's mechanical. Um, Manual is a pretty important part here. It requires somebody to operate it. Um, and it's intermittent, and, and, and we think that's OK. Uh, here's the picture part of the presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, there's some different ways you can do kitchen ventilation. Um, when I grew, up in, I grew up in a house that had one of these fans that you see here, um, this wasn't the one from my house, but it looked basically just like that with all the sort of crusty dust, uh, you know, greasy dust uh, blocking the exit. Um, ironically, depending on where those fans are, if the fan is right above, it's a, if it's a ceiling fan right above the range hood or, or, or um, right above the stove or close by, um, that's obviously better than if it's somewhere else. Um, range hoods, if you have a window like this in your house, then I would say, and you want to open th th these windows every time you cook, then say that you're, you're, you're probably getting a lot of benefit from that. So go ahead and do that. And uh, ceiling exhaust fan. Okay, different categories of ranges. I'm going to show you results from performance studies. This is just kind of the nomenclature. Uh, the under cabin is, is sort of the most common type of range hood. Um, the microwave, com the combination microwave range hood is very, very popular. Um, from our understanding, this is the, the, the most common thing going into new homes today across the country. Uh, people like the utility of having the microwave right above the range. And so th those two things get combined. Um, I'll mention later, I'll mention it now, but I'll mention later again. We think in most cases these are being installed as recirculating hoods. So they suck air up through the bottom and then they spit it back out through the top. And we, we often call these forehead greasers because if you're just the right height, then that, 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 that grease stream is coming right at your forehead. Um, chimney hood, uh, this could be either over an island or a wall. And then the downdraft. Uh, we haven't seen one of these in practice. We haven't tested, but the one on the left here we think is kind of a cool design where it actually kind of comes up. So the problem with a lot of downdraft is you're fighting gravity, right? The buoyant plume is shooting up this way, and you're trying to pull something down. So the nice thing about this design is it actually comes up above where you're, where you're cooking. So uh, they, they may actually be pretty good. Most of you are going to talk about range hoods as, as a device that's going to sit above. That We think sort of the physics generally work better. Um, we do have some results from these um, downdrafts, a couple downdrafts that we measured in the field. Uh, I'll show you those. Range hood designs. So the design we do think is important. Um, we are not range hood design engineers. We've talked to some of those. They know that stuff much better than we do. But uh, in general, there's, we like to sort of put them in three categories. There are these nice flat profile ones. Um, 
they have a lot of utility because they have grease screens across the bottom, so you can just pull the grease screen out, throw it in the dishwasher in a lot of cases, um, if you have the right size dishwasher. And, and there's a lot, it, it's sort of easy clean up there, and then you don't have to look at the grease kind of accumulated inside what is the second category, which is this um, something that actually has a collection hood. And, and the term is sump. They use the term sump area in the business. We use the term sump volume because it really is more of a volumetric thing. Uh, but the idea is that you have some kind of a hood that's going to temporarily capture the exhaust coming up and then suck from that area, from that area or that volume. Uh, and then, and then there's, there's the small sump and then the large sump. And, and uh, another important characteristic, which I'll refer to later, is how far over the burners the uh, range has come. And I think I have a good picture of that later. What information can we as consumers have about how effective these hoods are if we're going to go buy a range hood? Well, um, the two most common pieces of information you can get about range hoods are the airflow and the noise level. And you, in most cases, can't get that information about all of the settings. And uh, in some cases, you can't rely on that information that's being provided. But there, there is a group called the Home Ventilating Institute. This is an industry organization. They certify test results for airflow and sound. So if you look at an HVI, cert, and they publish this in a catalog every year, so you can find products where you can at least know that there was a standard test done to measure the airflow, to measure the sound level, and somebody else made sure that test was done correctly. Very helpful. A, a quick note, um, the, these are fans, and I'm going to show some system curves, so how much airflow you get as a function of the pressure drop. So if you have a lot of pressure drop in your ductwork, you're going to not get as much airflow. So how much pressure there is, the test condition is very important. Range hoods are mostly tested, almost all of them are tested at 25 pascals. Uh, we think that's probably not a high enough level. We think that probably a lot of installed systems have higher pressure drops. And what's interesting is, um, I'll show you in, in a minute, uh, the, the, uh, probably a better number is something like uh, 62.5. It's a funny number, but it corresponds to a quarter inch of water column. And that's why that number is there. So we think that's probably a better number. Very few ranges are tested at that point. Uh, Energy Star. So Energy Star, um, you can get a, 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 an Energy Star labeled range hood product. Um, the requirements for Energy Star is that there's a fan efficacy. So it moves a certain amount of cubic feet per minute per watt. OK, so it's basically a relatively efficient fan. And then also that they're relatively quiet. And then the last one is less than 500 CFM, the idea being there, if you're moving a lot of air, you have to condition that air. So it's not necessarily just the energy it takes to move the air. It's more about the energy it takes to, to condition the heat and cool that air over the course of a year. So that's why there's a, a requirement of, of limiting the fan size. Uh, and then manufacturers provide information. In most cases, they're providing the information about the, t the test results that they're sending in the HVI for these ratings. In some cases, they're providing information that's not rated or not certified. And, and that can become a problem. Uh, here's an example. Here's a product that talks about the 900 CFM centrifugal blower. This is great. This is just wind tunnel. And then on the right-hand side, we have the test results that we measure in the laboratory. Um, there's three things. There's the fan efficacy which is either liters per second per watt or CFM per watt. The power use, and you see the power is pretty flat in this case at the different settings. And then the bottom is the flow versus static pressure. So if you look at the bottom plot here, and if I can come up with the, uh, there we go. So this is in liters per second. Up top here is in CFM. So it goes from about 150 to 400 CFM. And what we look at down here is, if you have no pressure drop, so this thing's just sitting out in space, not attached to any ductwork, then you get pretty good uh, airflow. At the high speed, you're getting almost 400 CFM. OK, that's a lot of airflow. It's not 900, though. right? So they're advertising 900. And this thing, the very, very best thing this, this is going to do is, is 400. OK, but in most cases, you're attaching some ductwork. And that's when you attach ductwork, that's where you go up this curve here to higher pressures, 
And again, we think that uh, 25 pascals is probably a pretty good number for a lot of installed systems. Uh, so now, now you're down to 350 CFM. Okay, so you're almost a third of, of what they're advertising. Uh, and the, the shape of those curves at the bottom there is very important because the more they are vertical, those lines are vertical, what that means is that you maintain your airflow even if your pressure drop increases. And the more that they're horizontal or bend over, it means that that device is much more sensitive to the installation. And if, if, if it's sensitive to the installation and someone didn't do a good job of low pressure drop duct work, then it means you're going to install that device and it's going to give you much less flow than what you thought you were getting. So, so what requirements do we have? What are the codes and standards related to kitchen ventilation? Well, the ASHRAE standard, this is uh, only required if adopted into, into a code, but the ASHRAE standard says that you should have at least 100 CFM at less than three zones. So there's a, there's a recognition that if it's too loud, no one's going to use it. So again, minimum 100 CFM, no more than three zones. An alternative is you can have five kitchen air changes per hour. Um, that can work out to a very wide range, depending on how big your kitchen is. If you have a small kitchen that's a separate room, that's way too little flow. If you have a large kitchen, like an open floor plan, then that becomes a prohibitively high number that you're not going to use. So uh, th there's some issues with that. They are working on fixing that to get sort of more uh, uh, it, uh, an option for the general kitchen that is uh, more generally relevant. Let's say that. Um, Air changes per hour. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. So this means that you, you set your flow rate according to the volume of the room that your kitchen is in. Um, now, uh, a very important part of this, ASHRAE, it's very interesting too because a lot of people know about ASHRAE ventilation standards, but they always think it's a general ventilation standard. There's a certain amount of air changes per hour required generally in your home, and they forget that there's this kitchen part, which is very important. There's also a bathroom part, which is very important. And those two parts may be even more important than the general. Um, interestingly, the ASHRAE standard also requires that you verify the airflows, that these are measured airflows or that you use a certified product under certain conditions. Now, here's the condition. The condition is there's prescriptive duct work, so there's a low pressure drop duct system, and the product has to be rated as 62.5 pascals. But if you remember, almost no products are rated at 62.5 pascals. So, so our understanding is that even people who say they are following the standard are actually not in practice following the standard. HVI offers guidelines for how much kitchen ventilation you need. They do a per linear foot of range. So they're saying if you have a wider range or, or cooking cooktop, you need more ventilation. There's some good reasons for that. Um, it basically translates to about 100 CFM minimum and 200 CFM recommended for a standard 30 inch range. This is for a slide in range or a cooktop or, or a counter cooktop. If it's an island, the numbers are slightly higher because it's kind of out in space. Energy Star, so Energy Star for homes, um, they tried to adopt the ASHRAE uh, standard and they got a lot of pushback from builders because builders said, hey look, people want microwave range hoods. That's what they want. They want the microwaves over the, over the, over the range and there were no microwaves that had ratings that allowed them to be put in in compliance with the 62 standards. Okay, so there, you can't find a microwave unless something has changed very recently that had, uh, that was rated, had a certified flow rating of 100 CFM and a certified sound rating of three zones or less. So this is a big problem because the builders are saying people want these things. There, there are no products that meet your requirements, okay? please don't make us choose between what people want and what's available for us to put in the home. So they, they came up with what I think is a reasonable compromise and they said, okay, we're gonna allow you to put these products in as long as you have this very low pressure drop duct work. It's six inch duct work, smooth uh, and, 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 and very direct. So we think that's a pretty good compromise um, because it, it, what it achieves is you make sure that you have some uh, capacity there for kitchen ventilation. And then even if that product is not doing everything we'd want it to do, you can always put a better product in later. 
Uh, the, this is a very interesting thing. So the International Residential Code um, does not require kitchen ventilation. If you go to the code, you'll go to it at the kitchen ventilation, and, and you'll think it requires it because it says install kitchen ventilation should have 100 CFM continuous or tw uh, 100 CFM intermittent or 25 CFM continuous. But when you read the fine print, what you realize it says, if you install kitchen ventilation, then this is what it should have. But you can also have a recirculating system. Okay, so you can put the, the forehead greaser there and it will meet code. And this is the code that is most commonly adopted by states. Okay, so, so in most states, California and Washington being important exceptions in most states, there is not a requirement for kitchen ventilation. There is a requirement for this makeup air. Basically, if you have a really big fan, they're saying you, you can't just suck the heck out of the air in your home without it, some kind of makeup air. So that, that's a good thing, at least. OK, so what's missing from the information that's available is this concept of capture efficiency. Does the thing do basically what we want it to do, which is get the stuff, the moisture, the odors, the pollutants out of your house efficiently? OK, and you see here this little cartoon about a certain amount is going to go up through the, through the range hood, and a certain amount is going to go out to the kitchen. And we've looked at, at, at trying to quantify this. Um, the concept is very simple. We, 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 we've done this. We started out with the gas. We just do a mass balance. We can calculate through combustion equations how much carbon dioxide is being produced down at the cooktop. We measure the airflow and the carbon dioxide concentration going out through the hood. So we know what's produced. We know what's leaving. There's a fraction there. That's the capture efficiency. Uh, here's some real data. These are two experiments. So uh, this is carbon dioxide over time in these experiments. Uh, we measure this by putting pots of water on the burners. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an actual cooking event. The top is from a back burner scenario where we have two pots of water on the back burners. And the, and the, and the, the red is from front burners. And you see a lot of carbon dioxide up in the hood when there's a lot of capture, as you'd expect, and not a lot when there's not a lot of capture. We're going to talk about two, uh, two studies we did. There was one field study and one lab study. Uh, in the lab, we uh, had obviously a sample of hoods that we selected carefully to cover a broad range of, uh, of, of, of product types. These were new, so they had no wear. We installed them at the standard heights as recommended by the manufacturers. We controlled and varied the pressure. We measured the airflow versus pressure, those kind of fan curves that I showed you previously. We measured the capture efficiency at different airflows, uh, sound and power. And then we also went out into, into, into the field. And uh, that was more of an opportunity sample. So these were used devices, uncertain where. Uh, we measured them as installed, whatever height they were installed. They weren't always within specs. Uh, we measured the airflow and capture efficiency at each setting. Uh, and then the sound pressure. So in the lab study, we looked at seven devices. We, we looked at a low cost, just you know, basic model. We paid $40 retail. The builders are getting them for a lot less than that, obviously. Um, the B1 is a basic. So this is one that's advertised as quiet. Okay, so it's kind of a step up. You see it's substantially more expensive. A1 was the first one that it was the lowest cost one we found that was 62.2 compliant. So it had this 100 uh, CFM 3 zone uh, setting. Two Energy Star models, uh, a microwave range hood, uh, and then this performance hood. The, 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 Standard price for this is six fifty. We got it. We were able to get it for about four hundred and seventy dollars on a on a discount uh, website. Um, so we, we're always sort of uncertain. Do we do we do we talk about what we paid for it or what? Most everywhere else we see this listed for six hundred fifty dollars. These devices generally cost more than five hundred dollars. So these are not cheap devices. Uh, we measured fan curves, flow versus pressure, capture efficiency, and power and, and fan efficacy. Uh, OK, I guess the picture didn't show up there. OK, that one didn't come out so well. Um, the impact of duct pressure on airflow, this is similar to the, uh, the plot I showed previously. Uh, up top is the efficacy and the bottom. I'm going to start with the bottom. You see a couple of these hoods have these very vertical lines. So they have fans that are responding well to higher pressure drops and still providing flow. But you also see, the, especially the uh, the dashed lines, the lower cost models, they're starting to turn over, which means that as soon as there's a little bit of pressure drop, they are, they are producing substantially less flow. 
Up top is the fan efficacy. I'm going to skip over that now. It's not as important. I, we don't think that's as important of a, of a characteristic, but we can talk about it in Q&A if, if you are curious about that. Um, this next plot, what you're looking at is capture efficiency. That's on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the flow. The bottom is liters per second. The top is CFM. So the, the range here goes from 50 CFM to 350 CFM. Um, and, and what you see uh, on top is when we're cooking on the back burners, below we're cooking on the front burners. So broad brush, you see that starting at the top, by the time you get to about 200 CFM and you're cooking on the back burners, most of these hoods will have pretty good capture efficiency. They're capturing 80 plus percent of the pollutants. Cooking on the back burners, 200 CFM or greater. As you start going down from 200 CFM, there's this 100 CFM point uh, on the back burners. Uh, we start seeing much lower performance. In this case, maybe 60%. Now you go to the front burners, and you know I I, I totally forgot. I, I usually start by asking, I usually start by asking three questions, which uh, I guess I could still do it now. Which is, um, how many people have range hoods in their homes? I, great. Uh, how many people know that your, keep your hands up for a second, how many people know that your range has vent to the outdoors? Okay, uh, um, most of the, for the web audience, most of the hands stayed up, so most people know that their range hoods. How many people use the range hoods every time you cook? Oh, okay, still about half the hands stayed up. Okay, uh, how many people now cook on the back burners every time? Okay, the people who have seen my presentations before, great. I'll show you data later. People mostly cook on the front burners. It's convenient, right? You, you, there's a burner right there in front of you. You go to the back when you need to. You look at these ranges with the high output burner. It's always in the front because that's the most convenient place. Going back to the, the slide now, you see uh, on the front burner, okay, uh, a couple things. First, starting back over on the left at 100 CFM, you're talking about 30% efficient capture efficiency. And even when you get to the higher air flows, there's a broad spectrum of, of performance. So they're not as robust and reliable. And, and, and basically, if you, if you just take a look, at most range hoods don't cover the front burners. So when you're cooking in the back, you're underneath that hood or you're underneath that device, the plume comes up and it gets sucked out. When you're cooking in the front, it has to turn in to, to get covered. And I, I think I have a picture showing that, but we'll see if it's uh, blocked out. Okay, so actually is a good example. If you look at uh, the bottom right picture here, this is a good example. Uh, uh, th this is, a, uh, this is a, a, a kitchen renovation situation, so this wasn't the original construction. This is not necessarily reflective of new construction, but you can see this range hood barely covers the back burners, and the business part of the range hood is just the grease screens that are the back two-thirds, okay? Um, it turns out, I was curious, why do ranges, why are they built in a way that wouldn't cover the front burners? And it turns out that if you, if you look at the measurements, the depth of most range hoods is about the same as the depth of a countertop cooktop. So if you have a countertop cooktop, a, a standard range hood will come and cover most of the front burner. Okay? But a lot of homes don't have countertop cooktops, they have slide-in ranges. The slide-in range, the cooktop, is six inches or more farther away from the wall than in that countertop cooktop. So then that shifts it out away from the range hood. So this is the in-home study. These are actual pictures from the in-home study. 15 devices, two downdraft, two microwave range hoods, three of these flat profile ones, two hybrids. So these, they have kind of a collection hood, but, but there's grease screens across the bottom that, that are going to interfere with the flow a little bit. And then six with an actual capture hood that, that sits above the cooktop. Again, we did this pots of water test, and we did some oven tests as well. Uh, just to confuse you, I, the, the results now are presented in a different way. It's still capture efficiency. In this case, though, it's all the hoods going across, 15 hoods. Uh, and up top is the flow rates. I'm going to start on the top, and the M and the R are the minimum recommended. That's the 100, 250 CFM. It's, it's, in some of them, it's slightly different because of the, the, the island cooktops. Um, but what you see is that in most of these homes, uh, there was at least some setting that achieved the minimum recommended flow rate, and a lot of them even the recommended flow rate, the, the 250. So there were, flow, there were settings that achieved these high flows. Going to the bottom now, what you see is that the performance is all over the map, literally from almost zero to almost 100%. 
And there were some devices, if you look over to the, to the right side, that performed well kind of across the board. Front burners, back burners, oven. They had high capture efficiencies. Unfortunately, these were you know, $1,500 giant hoods <laughs> that are not going to go into most homes. Um, B2 was kind of interesting because it was, I think it was about a $400 hood, four $500 hood. It has pretty good, pretty good coverage. Uh, had a, a decent flow rates and that, that performed pretty well. Over on the left though, you see the down, D1 is an interesting one. This is a downdraft. It did very well for the back burners and did nothing for the front burners. Maybe not that surprising because it's right there by the back burners. It, it, it was one of these pop-up ones. So it pops up right there over the back burners, but it didn't do anything for the front. Uh, and, then, and then there are lots of hoods that did well on the back, but terrible on the front. Okay, so that's, a, that, that's something we've seen over and over again. So uh, this raised the question though. So we're interested now in this question. Um, what we want is we want a test method that we can institute to um, measure capture efficiency to provide information to consumers about what the capture efficiency of a hood is before they buy it. Um, but there was this open question of whether or not the capture efficiency for the, the cooking particles is going to be the same as the capture efficiency for the gases. So again, with a, uh, support from the CC, we, we, we looked at this. Um, DOE is supporting the standard activity. We did two cooking activities that produce particles. Uh, we pan fry a beef burger on medium heat uh, on the back burner, and then on uh, the second cooking activity is stir frying green beans in a wok on high heat on the front burner. And, and, we, and then we controlled everything we could imagine uh, using standard products, weighing them before and after, the exact amount of time we're cooking, the amount of time, number of times we flip it over, everything's ex it's exactly the same as we can do. Uh, we quantified gas capture efficiency is the way I said. And the particles we had to do by difference in the room. You can't measure particles in the hood to see how many particles you're sucking up through the hood because you're losing particles along the way. So the way we have to do is we have to look in the room and say, if you, if you cook without the hood being on, then you get a certain particle concentration. And I'll show you what those data look like. I'm going to just skip over the pictures here. Um, that's Woody, by the way. This is a wide angle lens, but this gives you some idea. We're cooking over here. Uh, and there's the hood. You see that behind the um, computer here is instrumentation. There's a blower door in the back. We're pulling stuff out. Uh, let me just want to get to the data though because we're pushing a long time. Um, so even controlling everything, particle generation varies a lot from event to event. Okay, so it was about a factor of two in the variation, which meant that we had to do a lot more experiments than we had wanted to do. Um, but that's you know science for you. So, so we, ac we, we accommodated or we, we, we accounted for the variability in the emission rate by doing a lot of experiments. So uh, we, we had pretty good statistics in the end. Uh, Mark is over here saying he knows that one well. Here's the, lo the linear scale. So you see how much variability there is in the concentrations without uh, the hood. And then with the hood, there's variability as well. Uh, this is just the log scale, so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, and then this is the CO2. In the, uh, in the exhaust, in CO2 in the, I'm sorry, in the hood. So this was very consistent. From, from experiment to experiment, the capture efficiency of CO2 was very consistent. So here are the results. Um, I want to stress, these are preliminary results. There are still some of these that we're, we're looking carefully at the experimental details. So by the time we come with a publication, you may see some differences in some of these numbers. Um, what you're looking at is the capture efficiency of four different hoods. And uh, you're looking on the left side, this is the CO2-based calculation. So this is looking at how much carbon dioxide we're seeing up in the hood. And on the right side, you're looking at the particles. And this is the calculated capture efficiency. And these are for the first particle one is all the particles, which is a pretty good, it's, when we're looking at all the particles, we're mostly looking at ultrafines. And then there are these different size ranges, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, et cetera. And, and within the CO2, all the way on the left is the pot of water experiment. The middle one is the pans where we have put the pan that we use for each of those experiments and we step back and we just let the pan sit there. And then the other one is while we're standing there cooking. And there's some good reasons why we would expect standing there cooking could influence the results. And, and in fact, we do see that um, in some cases. The blue is the high speed operation 
and the red is the low speed. So whatever the speeds were, and these were all done at the uh, set point of the uh, 25 pascals. So broadly what you see is that for this burger on the back burner, we have pretty high capture efficiency of both the gases and the particles. Okay, so that's good. That reinforces what we've seen previously across all the hoods. In some cases, it gets slightly lower on the, the red, on the, on the uh, low speed, but not appreciably lower in this case. This is lab conditions, remember, right? So we're controlling the pressure. Everything's controlled. It's a new hood, clean grease screens, et cetera. Um, now we're looking at the, the stir fry on the front burner. And what you see is that for some of the hoods, we get very good capture of the particles that are being produced from the cooking activity. This is this large sump hood. This was the one that's you know between $450 and $650. It covers the cooktop pretty well. Um, and we see slightly lower capture efficiency when we're cooking than when the pots of water are just sitting there. Okay, that's, a, that's, that's along the top, so it's maybe uh, 65, 70% instead of uh, 90 plus percent. Um, and then, but the particle is also pretty high capture efficiency. With the microwave, uh, uh, this is the front burner now, we see, uh, starting to see a difference. With the, with the high speed operation, we still get pretty good capture. With the low speed operation, not so much. Um, interestingly, these numbers on the left are slightly higher than the numbers that we previously measured. So, so those numbers might come down. We're, we're reviewing those results kind of, somebody's doing that as we speak, uh, is going back to make sure we got the flow rates right and everything else. Um, down the bottom, though, you see that for this energy star hood, it's energy star, it's great, right? Well, it does pretty good on the gases, but on the particles, not so much when you're cooking on the front burners. And then the economy hood, even worse. So, so we have some more work to do here to figure out if the gas capture and the particle capture, if we can, if we can design a simple test that tells us something about the particles. Because the particle capture efficiency test that we are doing is not suitable for an industry test. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's too complicated to set up, too costly. So we need to find a cheaper way to provide that information. Uh, Peggy asked me to address this question. Um, and and uh, the, are range hoods really much better? Because we're talking about range hoods, we're talking about kitchen ventilation. That fan in your ceiling, can that be just as good as your range hood? And, and the simple answer is that range hoods really are much better than that fan in your ceiling. I, I have a four slide set here that I could talk about if you're interested in the Q&A. I, I, I'm not going to talk about it now because I think it's fairly intuitive that if you're sucking up the pollutants from right above where they're being generated, that's more efficient and effective than allowing them to mix around the room and then sucking them up. Okay, so I'm going to skip that. Very important question, which is, um, how often is kitchen ventilation used in the U.S.? And there's, there's really three... <laughs> There's two elements to that, and then there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a related element. So in order for it to be used, it has to be there in the first place. So a, it's an open question. How many homes have exhaust ventilation in their kitchen? And, and the short answer is we don't know. We, we, there's, no, there's no national data on this. We can make some uh, a general, a good, generally good guesses, and I'll show you some of the data that we have collected in California. But we do know that very few states require it. Uh, we know that there are regions where it's very uncommon. I've had talked to builders and contractors who I asked them, you know, what percentage of the homes in your area have exhaust ventilation in the kitchen? They think for me, they say, I, you know, ballpark zero. Okay, so there are places where it's just not common. And uh, again, there's some data from like healthy homes assessment, but it, it has been compiled together. So. We don't know, but we have pretty good reason to believe there's lots of places in the country where it doesn't exist. The second question is, okay, so if you have it, do people use it? And we do have some data there that I'm going to show you now. Um, th this data is mostly pulled together from, again, various uh, surveys, uh, creative studies that we've done over the years. Um, we did some internet uh, stuff where we looked at, we looked at Zillow listings, Zillow.com listings, that enabled us to look into people's kitchens without having to bother the people to see what was physically there. Um, we did some online surveys. We have data from this uh, air quality study that we did in California, et cetera. So this is from the Zillow survey, this looking and seeing, okay, listings. And we took a, we took us we actually tried to get somewhat of a representative sample. So we pulled different age groups. We did, some selective, we did some random sampling from, the, from, these, from this 
site around the state. So we looked at different price ranges, different areas of the state, different age groups. Um, so about half of the homes we looked at had microwave range hoods in them. Um, and then about a, a, a third of them had these uh, short ones. And a relatively small number had nothing above the cooktop. What we don't know, though, is how many of those were vented versus recirculating. Um, and then we, we made our best guess from looking at the pictures of how much coverage there was of the cooktop. And uh, about half of them covered about half the back burners, which, 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 is, which, which corresponds to the fact that if it's a microwave or the, the basic hood, it's going to be um, not covering very well. Uh, and then there were some that covered maybe 75%. Very few covered the cooked up entirely. Um, I mentioned we, we, we have a pretty good idea that new homes, uh, the most common one going in is the microwave, and older homes, it's, it's, it's more of a mix. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, so how much do they get used? So this is all self-reported. This is based on a web-based survey. Um, no, I'm sorry, this is the California IAQ study. So this, this we're interviewing people, talking to them over the phone, trying to figure out if they're telling us the truth or not. Um, but but they, the people who are participating in the study signed up to participate in an indoor air quality study. So, so my best guess is that these numbers are, are biased high in terms of usage. These are people who are thinking enough about indoor air quality to sign up for this study. Okay? And also, they know it's an indoor air quality study, so if they have any idea we, we tried as much as we could to not clue them as to what, what we wanted them to say. Um, but we, you know, probably some of them figured it out. So, so we asked them, you know, how often do you use it? Uh, a relatively small percent said they use it all the time. Um, a, a larger percent say when needed is kind of the, the most common answer. So it's about a third who say they use it some of the time. is a third who say they use it when needed. Um, and there's a lot of people who either don't have it or don't use it at all. Uh, th there was a new home uh, study, a mail-out study about ventilation years ago, roughly consistent results. So, so, so a lot of people say, I use it when it's needed. And, and that's kind of consistent with our experience. I, I'm looking around the room, people are nodding their heads. It's like, you're cooking something, it gets smoky, boom, you push the button. And we, we've seen that, we've experienced that, I, I think that's a fairly common thing. You're cooking something that's very odorous, maybe, so you, you're going to think more about it. A lot of people say, I don't use it because I just don't think about it. Okay? It's like, if, unless there's something that's obviously telling me I need it, they don't think that when I turn on the burner, I need to start the ventilation. Um, this was a question, this is a web-based survey, and we asked the question in a slightly different way, which we think may be better, which is, we, we didn't say, in general, how often you use it. We said, did you cook yesterday? Yeah. Did you use your range hood? It's a very discreet piece of information that they either did or didn't. Now, they, they may lie to us, but there's, there's no, I mean, it's, this is, we weren't paying them or anything. They, just, they volunteered. Again, it's a group of people who are answering an indoor air quality survey, so they, they probably have some interest in this. But even in this group, only half the people, less than half the people, said that they used the range when cooking dinner the night before. So, so we think that all this evidence reinforces the fact that most people, there's a, a, there's a minority of people who are using these things regularly. And, and probably a much larger number of people who are using them as they perceive a need. Why not? Why aren't people using them? I'm sorry, this is why they do use them. Again, the same thing. Uh, half people say it's, it's when, when smoke happens. 30% uh, say it's to remove odors. Those are the two biggest reasons. And then the reasons for not using them are the ones, again, you would guess, oh, I don't need it. I don't use it when it's not needed. And I don't use it because it's noisy, which most range hoods that are in people's homes are noisy. Uh, I'm going to skip the fan speed. So um, hopefully you get the picture. OK, so um, I'm going to stop in just a minute here. But I, I love this picture. Um, I could talk about what's on the left of the picture. But, but first, um, obviously, is an interesting picture that's going to attract your attention. So in the room, well, you can probably actually read it. I should, I should, put, this, I, I, I should put this up without the, the explanation there. I'll just tell you, um, these are the materials that I pulled out from the duct above my range hood, it's actually from there's a little there's a little backdraft damper there. After the roofers finished putting a roof on my house, okay. Now before I did this, the roofers came, they did their business, they're professionals, they know what they're doing, right? Uh, they left. I turned on the button. It was a little noisier than usual, but these things are noisy in the first place, so you know I could perceive a little bit there, okay. 
knowing what I know, though, I was like, oh, I'm kind of curious. How much, how much roofing material did they drop down through this duct? What they do is there's a roof cap. Okay, if you look up in your roof, there's a roof. If you have a, a exhaust to your roof, they pull off the roof cap, okay, and then they leave the little stub there. Well, very often there's roof above that little stub, okay, and unless they cover that thing over, which they're often not going to do because they're working over a couple of different days. So if they cover that over, then how do you use the device, right? So they leave that open, and they just start ripping off roofing material, okay? Ripping it off and throwing it down. Well, you know, you've, if anybody who's seen roofers work, you know a lot of roofing material gets all over the place, okay? So this is me. There's probably a lot of homes out there that have had roof in place that have a bunch of stuff above the... Now, the, the airflow through this hood with this material sitting... The, the backdraft damper, people on the web can't see this, but basically it's just a little flop of metal that you can imagine opening when you pull on it. So when, when the air is being pulled through, this little flop of metal goes up, and then it closes when there's no air being pulled to stop air from coming down through that vent into your kitchen. Okay, so it, it stops this cold flow down through your kitchen, and, 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 but it allows you to air. This, was, this hood was going to have basically no flow in it. There's no way this fan is, 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 is pulling a backdraft damper open with all these materials there. So this is one of the things that can happen. So what deficiencies exist? Now we can talk about the words. Many homes don't have venting kitchen exhaust. We know that. Even vented hoods are not consistently effective. People don't use them. Many don't cover the front burners. The flows as installed don't match the ratings, and they're too noisy. Other than that, we're golden. Uh, I mentioned depressurization. It's, it's about 11.03. Um, I got time. Oh, OK, great. So um, uh, this, the question is, so what is this depressurization thing? The, how many people in the room, just out of curiosity, know, when I say depressurization-induced backdrafting, for the people in the room, how, how many people does that term mean something to you? Oh, OK, maybe a quarter of the people. OK, so I'll explain what the issue is here. So you see this nice little cartoon. Uh, you see uh, the, the big hole in the side of the house. Now, um, believe it or not, most of you have this hole in the side of your house. You don't think it's, it, it doesn't look like a big hole because it's spread out over lots and lots and lots of places. There's lots of little cracks and gaps and things like that that allow air to infiltrate through your house. If you've had air sealing done to your house, that hole is going to be smaller. But basically, you have a hole. So when you suck something out, like if you have a furnace in this case, if your furnace is in your living space, which by code now it shouldn't be, but there are lots of homes that have the furnace in the living space. They were built older. Um, that furnace is sucking. If it's a natural draft furnace, it's sucking air from the home to vent the, 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 the exhaust gases out of the home. So you're sucking air out. It has to come in through somewhere. Well, it comes in through all those gaps and cracks, the equivalent of this hole in the side of your house. OK, that's fine. I show here one Pascal. So if you have a pretty leaky house, your furnace comes on, you're depressurizing somewhat. Maybe it's a Pascal, maybe it's less. OK? Now, uh, let me just see, did I skip one? Good, OK. So now, the same leaky house, you turn your range hood on. And maybe you're sucking a couple hundred CFM out of your range hood. I don't remember what the number is here, whether it's 200 or 300. OK, now you're starting to depressurize a little more. Okay, but it's okay because you have this big hole. But now, you've done your nice air sealing, make your nice energy efficient house. Now you don't have a big hole anymore. Now you have a small hole. Okay? You're still trying to suck the same amount of air out. Okay, so what's going to happen? You're going to create a little bit of a vacuum inside your house. You're going to depressurize that space. When you create that vacuum, okay, now the furnace or the water heater has to try to pull against that vacuum. So what you have is you have these hot exhaust gases, which have some buoyancy, right? So they're pulling up. They're trying to go up. But then you have the big honking exhaust fan that's pulling that maybe has more force to it than those hot exhaust gases. This is the issue. The issue is that if you have an air-sealed home, you have a tight home, and you start pulling on exhaust fans, you may pull exhaust from those natural draft appliances into the home. Now, the furnace is probably an example because if most furnaces, um, it's very uncommon to still have these natural draft um, uh, central furnaces. But there's, if, you, if you're looking at a wall furnace, most wall furnaces are still natural draft. 
Okay, so a natural draft wall furnace, you could pull exhaust back in or a water heater. So that's this issue. Um, we actually think it's probably somewhat, the, the concern about it is somewhat uh, overstated. We think people are getting scared about a lot of homes and situations that they probably shouldn't be scared about, um, especially in contrast to the fact that they're not uh, concerned at all about their cooking burners, which are back drafting all the time. But this is the issue, and, and, and even, the, we, we don't want this to happen, obviously. This is not the way these things are designed to work. So when we start putting in kitchen exhaust, we need to pay attention to this. Um, these are numbers that go along with it. Um, I, I'm going to actually get away from the numbers because um, I don't want to go through that in detail. What I will say, though, is that um, one of the reasons we think that there's a little bit um, of a more of a scare than there should be is that if you need a lot of flow to cause a depressurization problem, if you need your dryer and your range hood and your both bathroom fans and everything else to be on at the same time, and it takes 500 or 600 or 700 CFM of, of airflow to cause a potential backdrafting problem, well, you have five or six or 700 CFM of ventilation there, okay? So unless that burner is really not working well, then at the same time that you are pulling pollutants into your home, you are ventilating the heck out of your home. Okay? So, so it conceptually, people don't account for that when they're looking at the hazard of this backdrafting hazard. And there's, a whole other, there's a whole other presentation. Maybe I'll come back another time and talk about backdrafting and, and what we're doing to, to, to look at that concern. But people have the, the model in your mind of airtight home so you got to be really, really careful of what you emit into an airtight home because there's not a lot of ventilation. So I want to be really careful about not backdrafting or spilling pollutants into that home, okay? But if it's taking 700 CFM to pull pollutants in, then that's not an airtight home anymore. That's a 700 CFM wind tunnel, okay? Again, the contrast is you turn on your cooking burner, you're spilling those pollutants. All those pollutants are coming into your house without any extra ventilation. So we're really trying to raise people's awareness. There is a combustion safety hazard that is in a lot of people's homes, but it's not the water heater and it's not the furnace. It's the cooking burners, right under your nose, literally. Okay, so what do you do to avoid depressurization? You can avoid exhaust fans with very high airflow rates. You don't need 500 CFM or 700 CFM on a, on a, on a range hood in most cases. Uh, you put a pressure release damper to basically uh, when you start sucking a lot, you have something that will open up to let air out, or you can have actually a makeup air system that's interlocked. So when you turn your range hood on, you're sucking out 400 CFM, and there's 400 CFM coming from somewhere else. What have we learned about performance? This is just kind of a couple summary slides. Actual airflow often is well below the ratings, and the sensitivity to duct pressure varies a lot by hood. Pollutant capture varies from terrible to great. Uh, it varies by hood, by speed, by installation. Much better for burners that are under the hood. Intuitive, I think. Um, seems like we need a, about 200 CFM, so that 100 CFM number is maybe not the right number. Uh, and on the, on, the front on the front burners, the capture of particles and gases seems like it could be very different. And we still have to sort of figure that out. What we still need to figure out, um, what are installed system pressures? So if we're going to have a, a, a rating system for range of performance, what's the right pressure drop to test them at? And, and the answer is we don't know. We don't know what system pressures are installed in homes. Okay? We know some people, some of done very well. It's a straight shot up to the, up to the roof with smooth 6-inch, inch, 7-inch, inch, 8-inch duct. Great. And we know sometimes it's a piece of 4-inch duct that you know, looks like a piece of spaghetti. So it, it really is all over the map. Uh, are recirculating range hoods or kitchen air cleaners with filtration and VOC removal a viable alternative? I didn't talk about that at all. This is two steps down the line, but people who are building passive houses, so these are very, very, very energy efficient houses, very tight, they say, you know what, we don't want to have uh, another penetration through our shell. We don't want to put in the makeup air systems for the exhaust generation. What we want to do is we want to just have these recirculating air cleaners. Is that viable? And in principle, probably so, okay? Um, what do we need to do to make sure it's robust and effective? That's still an open question, okay? And the, and the other open question is, we know we can remove VOCs, we know we can remove uh, uh, particles through air cleaners. Um, uh, how much of a problem are the, uh, is the moisture, okay? 
it, it, do we need to worry about removing the moisture as well? And, 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 and it, it, to me, it's still a very open question. If there's a lot of cooking, if there's a lot of cooking, it's, it's probably a problem. Okay, but the amount of cooking that most people do nowadays, it, it's not clear that just so much moisture produced that that's going to be a driver for the exhaust ventilation. So this is a kind of a future research question. Uh, what standards, including tests, metrics, and requirements, are needed to support a shift to automatic kitchen ventilation? As I said, as long as it requires something to push the button, a lot of people aren't going to push the button. And, and, and I think people shouldn't have, to, shouldn't have to push the button. It's a basic service. We want, we want your, your home should provide you with a safe environment. We should install equipment in homes that if the homes are operated reasonably, they're safe. There's no reason that we can't make automatic range hoods. There are engineering challenges. It's not easy, but we can accomplish that, and we would like to see that, and we're going to try to work for that. Uh, the policy agenda, we think the starting point is we just have to first do the most basic thing. For right now, the answer is every new home built in the U.S. should have exhaust kitchen ventilation, preferably a range hood. There should be an exhaust duct above the range for the purposes of removing pollutants and, and moisture. Uh, we want to require minimum capture efficiency, not airflow. So we want performance standard, not a, a flow standard. And we want more products with high capture that are quiet and low energy. We, frankly, when we look across, we, this is not a systematic survey. This is just kind of our impression. There are not enough good options that are in that, let's say, $300 or less price range that are low energy, quiet, and effective uh, at removing pollutants. There are some. It's not there's nothing out there. There's some very good products out there. We would like to see more. And we think that just, just when the reason why there's not more is because there's not attention to it. Once we have every confidence that the manufacturers, when, when, the, when the market demands it, when people are, know what they're looking for, they know they want a, a, a product that has high capture efficiency and is quiet and is low energy, we have every confidence that the industry, they are great engineers in the industry, they're going to make great products that satisfy those needs. We just need to uh, make sure that people can have that information and then we think there will be a need. Uh, and, and that's what I have for now. So um, thanks for uh, indulging me for an extra few minutes here. Uh, and I'll take any questions. Uh, Zoe, you're going to organize the question. Do we start here or start on the web? Right. Start OK. Oh, sure. OK. Great. This, this is the sequence. If this is not covered in the talk, what? Epi studies, epidemiological studies that support or confirm the hazards and dangers of cooking on human health. Producing toxin and pollutants is one thing, but actually causing health hazards is another. Just because you can measure it doesn't mean it will produce a health effect. That's an excellent question and it's an excellent point. Um, there are certainly studies showing um, respiratory, uh, higher uh, 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 percentages of respiratory system symptoms in homes that have gas appliances and measured nitrogen dioxide levels that are higher. So there, there are associations in homes between elevated nitrogen dioxide and these increased respiratory systems. Uh, that's probably the most solid set of evidence uh, that I know of. I'm going to move on. Uh, somebody's phone's ringing. Okay. What about electric cooking? Are there any hazards associated with these? I think I addressed that one, so I'm going to just go on. Um, I know that guy. Uh, okay. Uh, here's my question. From cooking literature, we understand that cooking is a source of health problem. After some years of study, we now need to know what would be the solutions for this issue and improvements in ventilation design would be a solution. How do you believe that reducing the pollutants from the source could be an alternative solution? Recent studies uh, show that reducing the cooking source emissions greatly reduce the level of ultrafine particles. How this type of idea is compared to the ventilation design approach? Very interesting. Um, I, 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 to be honest, I am not familiar with the studies with, uh, cited here. Um, so I, I can't really comment on that. Um, in terms of reducing the source, though, I, I, I'm, this is cooking. So people are going to cook how they're going to cook. And I, you know, something else I usually say, I'm going to say it now. Please, please don't come away from this talk thinking, oh my gosh, I should never cook again in my home. I cook all the time. I have an old Wedgwood stove. I love to cook. I cook with gas. I encourage you to cook. Cooking is wonderful. It's creative. <laughs> it's healthy. Please cook. Just have a venting range hood and turn it on. Everything will be fine. 
So I, I, I don't quite understand maybe the, the, the commenter can write in, but I thank you for, for pointing to the studies. Um, I'm guessing that it has to do with um, maybe uh, pollutants from the burners. I'll, I'll take one opportunity to say that um, we have very limited data. We've collected data just kind of in an ad hoc way. Um, induction cooktops. So these are, that's an electric cooktop. Induction, it, it, it's a different technology. We believe induction cooktops probably do produce a lot less ultrafine particles than the, the hot coils. So basically the, the, the coil electric burners, any really hot surface, your toaster, if you turn your toaster on, there's nothing in it, you just turn your toaster on, you are going to produce ultrafine particles. Okay? What happens is dust settles in there, and then that very hot surface volatilizes the dust, stuff, the gases get out into the air, and then they recondense into particles in the air. That, we think, is the mechanism. That's what's happening on the electric burner. It happens in your hair dryer. It happens on your radiator. And it happens in your toaster. It happens in your coil burner. Induction burners heat the pot directly without having that coil. Now the question is, does heating the pot then produce particles? We don't know. Okay. But the burner, the induction thing itself doesn't. Um... Okay. Can you address the retail promotion of large range hoods by kitchen designers and appliances manufacturers where the operation of the fan is done without consideration for pressure differentials, i.e., have there been any attempts by the HVAC industry to educate the retail world? Um, so first, I'll say that uh, again, the code there is a code required that the the IRC, the International Residential Code, does say that if you put a big fan in, you are supposed to have makeup air. That is a requirement that's in place in in, in many jurisdictions throughout the country, as far as we understand. Um, I think that there are a lot of engineers, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of contractors and, and home builders that recognize this. And when they're putting in big ranges, they actually are providing for it. There are probably a lot who aren't doing it as well. And yes, there is a need for education. We are trying to do that. Uh, the industry is trying to do that too. The industry, uh, I know a couple of manufacturers of, of these products. They, the, 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 the range hood manufacturers are also making the, 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 the uh, makeup air systems. Uh, one of the manufacturers recently actually uh, uh, put out a tool to help the designer or the contractor pick out the right equipment. So, so yes, the industry, I think, is actually doing a lot to try to make sure that people install these systems safely. Um, have studies been done to measure soil gas infiltration while under negative pressure created by various ranges, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so th th there is an issue there. Of, uh, this is one of the other effects of depressurizing homes. I'm not going to get into it because it gets into a whole uh, a different set of indoor air quality concerns. But yes, it, you, you, you could have that problem. Okay, are there range hoods uh, available with built-in add-on features to minimize the amount of pollution emitted in the ambient air? Um, I, I think that, uh, as I noted, there are uh, lots of different performance specs. There are some range hoods, but I will say that um, are recirculating range hoods that uh, advertise that there's air cleaning. So they have a, some kind of a charcoal, uh, or like an activated carbon uh, uh, impregnated filter. Okay? Uh, they're probably not removing very many particles. And after the first couple uses, maybe never are they probably removing so much gases. But we, we haven't tested them, so I can't say that for sure. This is just my impression based on seeing what the product is. Um, have you looked at induction stove burners? Okay, so we talked about that. Many hoods, like my new microwave hood, have high, medium, and low settings. It would be nice if consumers knew how many CFM were at each of those settings. Comments? I think I addressed that, which is that, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the general advice we give people is to use the hood all the time and use it on the highest setting you can tolerate the noise. Okay? Um, in terms of how much uh, flow gets generated, it varies all over the map. Microwaves are very interesting because, you know, we tested three. We tested two in the field and one in, in the lab. We got very different performance of those three microwaves. I think there are some that have very good fans, uh, that, you know, they have these, these straight up and down uh, uh, fan curves. So, uh, so we think that they probably perform pretty well, at least on maintaining their airflow. We think others do not. Okay, so, so there's a lot of it. And unfortunately, right now, it's hard for consumers to see that. Consumers can't see that information. So that's one of the things we think is a market deficiency right now, is that the people who are making the better products, um, you know, it, it's not always obvious to the consumer that their product is a better product. So I think better information, better awareness by the consumers 
will, will help reward the manufacturers who are making the better products. Will the homeowner tolerate automatic operation or will she bypass it? Should he or she be allowed to bypass it? How can you say we need ventilation for electric cooking without showing any data? How about induction cooktops? Okay, so I, I think I did show uh, data on the cooking. So you saw the particle concentrations resulting from the cooking. So electric burners, you cook on them. So just from the cooking itself. Um, and then I, if you look at the uh, citations, or a citation in there, I think by Denicamp, where uh, measured uh, particle emissions, uh, ultrafine particle emissions from these electric burners. So, so that's, it, it's there. Uh, and then we'll-, we'll Doc, Dr. Stan, let's, let's take a couple of questions from yeah. the audience. Okay, I just want to say, in terms of the automatic operation, uh, that's a good question. I, I think if the products are uh, you know, quiet enough, uh, I think people will tolerate it, but you know, that, that, that's a policy question that I- Yeah, I'm Kevin Messner with the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. Hi. Uh, uh, interesting uh, research. Thanks for presenting. Presenting it. Two, two questions. I think you answered one earlier on the nitrous oxide. So health implications of nitrous oxide are potentially respiratory. The nitrogen dioxide Sorry, nitrogen is dioxide. a respiratory irritant. It's one yeah. of the six pollutants that was identified in the Clean Air Act as being enough of a problem in outdoor air that there was a whole series of regulations that uh, regulate the concentrations of that pollutant that's allowed outdoors because right. of the known established health effects. Um, the EPA has a wide monitoring network to make sure that we never exceed those standards outdoors anywhere, and we generally don't. Right. And if you do exceed those standards outdoors, these are, these are standards set for the general population, which includes sensitive subpopulations, but not the most sensitive individuals. So these are the outdoor standards. If, if you exceed those standards in your outdoor air, if that happened, let's say, in uh, Sacramento, the California Air Resources Board would be required by law to submit a plan to the federal EPA to say how we are going to make sure that we clean up the outdoor air so we don't have those concentrations in the outdoor air because the general population will be exposed to them. That's the standard that's being exceeded, we think, in more than half the homes in California that are cooking with gas. Gotcha. Okay. And then that's, um, that's if they're not venting. I should say right. if they're not venting. Yeah, with the vent hoods. Right. Uh, so if, if which, they're venting, it's a different situation. Right. And we agree with you that, yeah, there's a lot of good cooking products out there, and people should continue to cook and have fun cooking. Yes. Absolutely. And vent hoods are, yeah. Good, good option as well. The other uh, question I had was on OTR, um, uh, microwave over the range. Yeah. Um, with a little unclear on your policy recommendation on those, you're saying some are okay, some aren't so good, or or. Well, I'll tell you what I what I you know. Is that better? Okay, maybe. Um, we should talk afterwards because um, what we would really like to see is we would just like to see them do the same thing that all the other microwaves, all the other range hoods do. So they operate, they have two functions, right? They're, they operate as a microwave and they operate as a range hood. Um, again, to our knowledge, up till recently, they were not being tested and rated, certified for their airflow and sound. What we'd like to see is we'd like to see people be able to buy microwave range hoods that are quiet enough and move enough air to meet the standards and that they're certified to do so. That doesn't happen right now. And, and so that would be, that's, that's our main policy recommendation is to try to find a way to push that to happen. And there's lots of different ways. We can try to create demand through education uh, and then we can try to work with the industry, industry to voluntarily do that. Uh, because again, we think in principle you know, we have nothing against over-the-range microwaves. It, I see the utility in it, okay? I've used them, they're great, okay? But if, you, if it is serving the function of the range hood, we want to make sure it has the functionality of being an effective range hood. And that includes moving air quietly, you know, energy efficiently. Right, and I had to think through it and think about it a little bit, but there's, we, we've 
always argued there's, there's a microwave standard and energy standards that are going through and standby and so there's microwave countertops and over the range and then there you have now combo convention convection microwave and so you there's a tendency when you're talking of energy efficiency that let's just lump them all together as microwaves and there are different because over the ranges are different and there's different things that you have to have and to deal with those and so they, they are essentially two different products and some of the things maybe and I said I have to think about it, I don't know this on whether some of that gets caught into oh it's just a countertop microwave over your over your oven so then you have you get a push and pull for manufacturers with energy standards over here and then you have other issues over there so we just need to think through it I hadn't really thought through it in, in this in this uh, in this area but it's something to, that I need to think about and talk to our members about and let, let's connect up after so, yeah. Yeah. so one of my one of my least favorite uh, things to do in the kitchen is to look at the at the uh, filter in the uh, rain uh, in the you know the vent and uh, or even to to clean it uh, would be even less. So, how does the condition of that thing, whatever whatever it is, uh, affect the efficacy of the fan? Or of I, the I, I think I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> I, I, I I I can't. I I I would love to reassure you and say, don't worry, just leave it there. You don't really need to clean it. Um, what I will tell you, <laughs> what I will tell you is that. Um, when you get that nice uh, greasy uh, dust cake on there, um, you uh, ma make a uh, probably a fairly effective filter. Uh, so whatever small amounts of air you are moving through there now uh, is actually removing, especially if you have like a recirculating one. So um, you, you know you let, let it get dirty enough, you're getting some small amount of filtration. Again, whatever small amount of air you're moving through there is at least being filtered. Uh, but I, I obviously say that uh, tongue in cheek. You should clean the grease screen, okay? Um, you know, and, and again, um, there's some very nice ones that you can throw in the micro in the, in the dishwasher. Uh, and you know, every once in a while, you have to just change it. They're not that expensive. It's, really for airflow, for sure. You, you you can have a lot a dirty a dirty grease screen is going to dramatically increase your pressure drop, okay? And it, and depending on the quality of your fan. Um, it may or may not then increase, uh, uh, reduce your flow rate. There's some fans, some of these devices have very good fans that are going to, uh, fan motors that are going to continue to move the air, as you saw, with a high pressure drop. Um, but, I, you know, the, the majority of them by volume sold are, are not going to have those fans. Um, on that screen, that's the one that says the, oh, oh. on the slide that says the green beans on front, I don't know what slide number that is, but it had, um, it had the graphs, shows large sump, microwave, flat, economy. The flat one, um, which, what kind of, of hood is that? Because we have one of those chimney hoods at home that's flat, but we paid like $1,500 for that. And I'm hoping it's not going to perform like this one that says flat. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the chimney ones that, that's like, you know, that's, that's just to the ceiling. It's not against the wall. You have like four, four um, screens. How, how high above the cooktop is it? It's the, what your may recommend, was it 30 inches or something like that? Whatever. Well, so the, the, the chimney ones actually vary quite a lot because sometimes people like to have them higher up. Oh, we had they, low because we're short. They work. Okay, so, uh, you know, here's the thing. Um, is it going, is, is it, if it's a flat profile, is it going to be as effective as if it's a, an actual hood? I don't think so, because when it's an actual hood, what happens is the plume comes up, it physically bumps into this, this thing, right? And, and, and if it's a flat profile, it's physically bumping into this flat profile. And you're sucking out of that, but if, if there's an actual hood, then the plume comes up, temporarily resides in that hood volume, okay? Yeah, well, let, let, the, the important thing is, is this, use it. I can guarantee you if you turn it on when you cook, you will be dramatically reducing the moisture, pollutants, odors that are coming into your kitchen. So it will, it will, it will help a lot, whether it's 30% or 50% or, my guess is that if it's generally those, those uh, more expensive, you know, the, the, the uh, um, 
the hoods that you're describing, uh, the chimney hoods, they generally move a fair amount of air. So it's just good general ventilation. So my guess is you're going to probably be somewhere in the 50 to 80 percent uh, uh, removal effect effectiveness. That's pretty good. That, that's enough to make the difference. By the way, that's enough to make the difference. I, I showed those numbers of the number of homes that, you know, that have uh, exceedances of air quality standards without venting. If you just throw a 50 percent hood in all those cases, you dramatically reduce those numbers. Okay, so just ha even having a, a really basic hood that's 50 percent effective really makes a difference. So go ahead and use it and enjoy cooking. I'm sure Dr. Singer will come over and test it after we're yeah. done here. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Singer. This is Kyle Kraus with the California Department of Housing. Oh. And I have a question. Uh, I didn't see that we talked about it. We talked about makeup air. Um, in your testing, did you do any kind of analysis on capture efficiency with a hood operating with a window open or with a makeup air device? Uh, not directly, okay, but, um, uh, well, I should say not, not, not formally, let's say that. We, 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 do, um, we do have some uh, evidence from some work that we've done in just sort of basic physics that um, when you're cooking on the front runners, um, big uh, movements around that area are going to affect the, 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 the plume dynamics, okay? Including if you're standing in front of your hood and you walk away, as you walk away, you're pulling air with you. So walking back and forth to the, to the, to the front of the stove is going to reduce your effectiveness. Likewise, if you have a window open, depending on the, the, where the air currents, you can have these cross breezes. So to the, whatever extent you have a cross breeze, that's also going to do. In general, the very best performance is the most quiescent condition. So that's why we do these pots of water tests. We sit the pots of water there. We're far over here. There's not a lot of cross breeze. In fact, there's no cross breeze. That's the best condition. In, in real life, it's going to be downhill from there. Okay. So are, are, are you saying that if there's a makeup air source or a window open that it could actually the makeup air impact is usually the not performance? Be a problem because the makeup air source, it, it depends on where it is. In a lot of cases, it's somewhere else. But if it's right there, okay, if the makeup air source is right there, then it, could, it, it certainly could affect the performance. Um, where are you thinking of the makeup air being? Well, somewhere not right near the cooktop, obviously, or near the hood because of the potential impact with a, a breeze but somewhere in the home as a source for makeup. If it's somewhere air. else, it, it's, it's probably not having an impact. The, the window open nearby, though, is, is probably having an impact. And it could be positive or negative. If, if, if the window is sucking, if, if you know, the dynamics at that moment, the air is being sucked out through the window, then it's probably helpful. And if air is being pulled in through the window, then it's probably unhelpful. Um, but, but the makeup air, you, if the makeup air is somewhere else, it's usually not that's not dramatically changing the airflow patterns uh, of the kitchen, unless, unless the makeup air is right there in that vicinity. Would you think if it was a wall inlet or some kind of a, a baffle that helped with energy efficiency, would it actually, or could it improve the capture efficiency and ventilation? Um, I, I, again, I think the best capture efficiency is going to be uh, quiescent conditions where there's no movement, nobody doing anything. But that's not reality. Um, I, I think the more important point is, um, I think that very, uh, uh, unless you have a uh, sort of commercial style cooking device, so for most people, the cooking devices that they're using, they don't need 400 CFM of kitchen ventilation, exhaust ventilation to have good capture efficiency. So the real solution I like to see is I like to see them have a range hood that goes from maybe 100 to 250 CFM and is pretty quiet 250 CFM and it covers the front burners and I think that's going to be fine. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, great. Sure. Oh, I, th I, this is a great one. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, <laughs> Uh, do I need to go on? Okay, so uh, the, the capture efficacy results show that there is no significant difference between different particle sizes. Is this true? Well, so, some of them there was. What about particles smaller than 0.3? We did see, so if you look closely, uh, for example, actually this, this slide that's up there now, uh, the flat one, the Energy Star hood, or the microwave, you see 
um, for the for the low speed, for example, in both cases, and for the high speed on the flat hood, you see a big difference between the CPC total, that's the first of the particle ones, and then the 0.3 microns. So these ultrafine particles are behaving more like the gases are, and the, 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 the bigger particles are behaving somewhat differently. By the way, there's a very complicated set of things going on here with the particles we don't fully understand. In part, it's because the particles are not, it's not like all these particles are being formed inside the pan and then emitted in the pan. These particles are being formed in the plume, we think. Okay, so when you start pulling parts of the plume off, how that affects the particle generation is a very dynamic, complicated process because it has to do with moisture, the amount of water vapor that's available, the amount of condensable products, the temperature. This is all happening very dynamically. So, so we, we actually can't fully explain all the differences that we're seeing in the particle sizes, but we've done these experiments with enough replication that we're pretty confident that these are real results. Um, I'm going to go on to the next one. Uh, health effects, measurement data from aldehyde from gas burners. Um, we have emissions measurement of formaldehyde from gas burners. It was another CEC supported project, uh, and that's a report that's available on the CEC website. It's a Singer, it's, you look at my name, Singer. It was a 2009 report that reports pollutant emission rates from these um, gas burners that we measured in the laboratory for nitrogen dioxide, ultrafine particles, formaldehyde, and CO. Um, if this is not going to, no, I guess, that's all the, I got through all the, oh, would, will opening a window in the kitchen have a significant impact on these contaminants? Uh, how does stove emissions impact the rest of the home? Okay, so two, two things. If you don't have, if you don't have a range hood, a venting range hood, do open a window because it will increase the general ventilation rate in your home during that time, which will reduce the concentrations of those indoor generated pollutants. If that's all you can do, that is helpful. That's better than doing nothing. Um, the second question about the kitchen versus the rest of the home, you saw those particle data er early in the presentation. In our indoor air quality study, and there's lots of other data, we, we've confirmed this through these recent measurements, in California homes, nitrogen dioxide concentrations in homes with gas burners are higher in the kitchen than in other places in the homes. We have very robust measurement data showing that. That's all I have. Do you have a few more, Zoe? We have a few more. Oh, OK. Does anyone make a barometric relief damper that is reliable to a few pascals? I believe, OK, does it reliable to a few pascals? Um, I've talked to builders and contractors who use these pressure relief dampers. Um, and, and they sort of swear by them, so I, I don't have personal experience, but, but I've talked to builders who use them. What they do is they, um, the, 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 they these are very energy efficient, so they're very tight homes, and they, um, there's some different practices, but, but one of the things they'll do is they'll set it so that it doesn't come on, they, they, they actually go and they set it so that it doesn't come on when you turn the range hood or a bath, the range hood on low or a bath fan on low, a bath fan, the, the damper doesn't open, but if there's a higher flow. So they set the damper basically to open so that you don't get any substantial depressurization. They allow a little bit, uh, but you can even an energy efficient home can, can tolerate 50, 70, even 100 CFM of flow. They just want to have these things, the damper open when there's uh, uh, higher flow rates. What are the most common toxic substances in the cooking aerosol? Uh, there's lots of things, pH. Um, again, acrolein is a, a, is a nice air pollutant that, that happens with uh, cooking oils. Um, uh, and then there's other stuff. There's other stuff associated with cooking the oils. Uh, what should we do about built-in ovens? Um, good question. Uh, you, you know, I, I, we, we used to build ovens that had a venting. Uh, you know, in fact, if you go... Uh, I don't know if we've ever done this with built-in ovens, but certainly uh, it's very common around uh, California, the area I live in, Oakland, and you go into a house in Oakland, San Francisco, and you see a, a vent in the wall that was for the oven. And, and the vent used to come up, not for the cooktop, interesting, but for the oven. And the cooktop wasn't vented, but the oven was. And, and, and I don't know the full history of that. Um, in principle, you should be able to vent a built-in oven uh, I don't, maybe you know, <laughs> if, 
I don't think there are any products now on the market that are built-in ovens that are made to be directly vented. But again, it, you know, in, in principle, it, it could happen. Um, Um, I'm watching the webinar, a few questions. Is there a difference in pollutant emissions from cooking based on what is being cooked? Yes. How large is the difference? Stir frying, baking, steaming greens, it's huge. It's all over the map. And as I said, even when we did exactly the same cooking events, we got a factor of two range of uh, pollutant emissions, of particle emissions. Uh, let me see. Uh, <laughs> Have you looked at pH levels in homes, cooking with gas ranges? Um, this is Gary in Denver. Hi, Gary in Denver. Um, I know Gary in Denver, actually. Uh, uh, no, but I think, hey, you had some, the pH measurements. A or B did a study of pHs in homes, I want to say the early 90s, is that the mid 90s? So if you look at the A or B website, um, uh, uh, in the indoor air quality section, there's publications, and I think there's a, a very nice publication on that. One more. From the I like this. I'm getting, I'm getting all these uh, nice questions and comments from people I know from around the country. It's kind of fun. Um, will you be incorporating Schlieren photography into your future studies? Uh, oh, that's an excellent question. So the idea here is that um, in terms of a, a test method, so that we're, we're doing this based on carbon dioxide measurements. Um, for commercial cooking, for commercial cooking, they, they use these visual methods, basically, where you can see uh, more or less the heat flow around um, so and 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 then it enables you to visually see where the plume is going okay um, it's a good question maybe I mean I'm, I'm certainly open to it there's a really important difference between residential and commercial though the, this question comes up a lot the broader question is can we use the same test method for residential range hoods that we use for commercial range hoods and, and my first answer is is I don't think so and the reason is that in commercial kitchens, there's a requirement that it's always going to be 100% capture efficiency, and there's excess airflow to make sure that happens. So the amount of airflow that we would have to have to make sure we always get 100% capture efficiency is probably more than we want for energy efficient homes. Okay, so, uh, so along with that, I don't think that these visual methods are going to be as helpful on the residential side because they're great they're great if, if your goal is making sure you always get everything. We don't need to get everything. I don't think we're going to want to or be able to get everything in terms of capture efficiency. So I don't think those methods are going to prove to be uh, the right answer. But I'm very open. We're having these discussions. I'm not precluding anything. Hi, this is Tom Shefflin from ARB. Um, were most fans measured at their CFM rating? I mean, you mentioned the 900. That was more like 400, so, so as I recall. So 900 is, a, is, is just a, it's just a, uh, it, it's a, it's a misleading number. OK, what it is is if you, if you took the fan out of that range hood and you just kind of put that fan in free air, then maybe it, it pushes that, that amount, you know, theoretically. But, um, uh, when you say we're most, you mean in our testing when we okay, test? Okay, let me just say it. Yeah. How can I trust what the manufacturer puts on the box? Well, the, the best way, the best way is to get a product that is HVI certified. So HVI um, uh, will look at test results, and the manufacturers challenge each other. Um, if 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 a, if a if a company says our product X moves 300 cfm. And the competing manufacturer says, That's, that doesn't move 300 CFM. There's no way that moves 300 CFM. They'll challenge it. And, and then, and then you know, there's an arbitration. There's a process of reviewing. Uh, but, but more or less, if you, look at, if you look at a number and it says HVI certified, you can go on the website, you can get this, uh, these numbers. Um, it's, I think it's a very robust process. So, so if it's an HVI certified flow, you, I think you should believe it. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Nope. Okay, we have one more coming on the internet. Um, I'm Peggy Jenkins with our indoor program, and um, I do have one other question for Brett, but I, first I want to thank Brett for all of his work. I want to encourage you all to look at his reports and papers. What he's presented today is just a, 
a really small amount of what he's done. He's done, he and others at LBNL have done a huge amount of work, so uh, there's a whole lot more information there for you. Um, and, oops, thank you. Um, and I, I did want to comment on the, the ARB cooking study that we funded a few years back. Um, that is on our web. We'll try to make it more visible. Um, we did look not only at PAHs, but a number of other emissions, including, I think, related to one of the questions uh, for the electric stove. We compared gas and electric. And actually, uh, Dr. Zhang here has also done some work with Ultrafine. So we'll try to highlight some of these studies on our combustion page. Um, but we definitely found electric cooking does result in some emissions too, uh, particularly based on what you cook. So the, the food you cook, for example, fish and various products with ammonia um, and nitrogens had higher nitrogen emissions and so on. So there is some additional information there. Um, <clears throat> so, um, thank you, Brett. I did have one last question for Brett. Could you mm -hmm, go right uh, ahead? If you look on the, the slide that has the, um, the, the references, the Fortman study is the uh, is this ARB report. That's right. Uh, so you can look and you can search for Fortman or for this, um, for this uh, contract number. Right. Um, and anyway, please. Okay. And uh, I have a question. I think then there's one more from the internet, and if anyone has an additional question. Um, Brett, I wondered if you could just let people know about your work on the ASTM test method. I think that's very important. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so there is an ASTM working group uh, that is, has been convened to develop a test method for capture efficiency. Um, and that pulls in people from the industry, from uh, you know, other research groups, uh, different parts of the industry. And, um, and that, that, that activity is happening. Um, we're sort of at a, well, actually, I, I, I'm kind of an advisor to that committee. I'm not formally on that committee, but the, there's, there's a little bit of, a, of an open question now about what to do about some of these results where we see that um, it, it, the cooking, the, the simple test method for the burners may not be predictive of all the range of cooking which leaves open the question, is it still worth having a capture efficiency test method for the burners? It's better than what we have now, which is nothing. So right now, there's nothing that tells us how effective these are. We would like to be able to give people something, even if it's imperfect. And um, it's a, this, that's a policy question. I don't know how that committee is going to resolve that, or that working group. Um, but we're, we're, they're working on it. They're trying to figure that out. Um, No, but if you contact me, uh, the question was, what's the working group number, the ASTM group number? And I, I don't know, but I can get it for you. Um, is there any concern, this is from the web, uh, is there any concern that if you depressurize even a little bit, would you possibly draw more radon in? Yes, you can draw more radon in if you depressurize. Uh, in commercial environments, periodic dust cleaning, duct cleaning, sorry, periodic duct cleaning is needed to avoid grease fires. Is this also recommended for residential? If so, are there any rules of thumb for frequency? Um, I'm not familiar with the duct cleaning to avoid grease fires um, requirements in commercial. Um, and I uh, have not heard of grease fires happening, which doesn't mean that they don't. They're just not familiar that this is a problem residentially. Um, uh, the grease screens do remove some of the grease. I mean, the, the, the manufacturers do try to do that. And the fans, I do know the fans, the products are rated so that they are not going to cause grease fires. So that's one of the special things. Uh, about range hoods that are different than other um, exhaust fans is that there is an attention to the fact that these are devices that are in environments that are greasy and so they are developed to avoid grease fires. Um, I think it's cool that people are still like tuned into the web. Um, right. <laughs> We have one more, and I, I actually just want to announce for those on the web, um, we are not going to have Dr. Singer respond to any more after this one on the web. If you send your questions, though, we will uh, forward them to Dr. Singer so he can uh, uh, reply and, and get a response to you. But at this point, we are going to uh, I think, draw I, I the web questions to a close. Inviting me to talk about something I don't know a whole lot about, which is it just says, uh, 
about the commercial that I mentioned that, that essentially they're required for 100% capture efficiency. Do you know how often this requirement is met? Well, um, I, I can't say for sure because I don't have data. My, my understanding is that this is like a lot of requirements, a lot of code and standard requirements. Code and standard requirements are not always met. It's sort of a sad reality of the world. So are there commercial kitchens out there that are not capturing all of their pollutants? We have, I, I've, there's some pretty good anecdotal evidence out there uh, that that's the case. Um, I can't say how frequently that comes up, but I'm sure there are plenty of commercial kitchens that do not have fully effective capture efficient uh, uh, range hoods. And there are probably many that do. Good. Apparently, this is a very hot topic. And everyone has concern about this because it's so, so close to us. Everyone probably will expose to some extent to the cooking mission. So, but since we are running out of time, so please help me thank Dr. Singer for this excellent topic. Thank yeah. you. Hey, thanks for sticking around. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>